Well, it's great to be with you guys again, and uh, excited that we get to open up God's Word together and spend some time just digging into the text, getting to know what Jesus would say. What, what, you know, because we, we talked last week about this idea of Jesus and his culture, and we said this culture was a chaotic world, and we live in a chaotic world ourselves. And so what would Jesus do, you know, it's kind of the question inside of a chaotic world, because I don't know about you, but I need that right now. I need to know how to live in a world that just feels sometimes out of control, sometimes like there's not answers, sometimes like it just doesn't make sense. And so we're going to work our way through the book of Mark. We started there last week, and I told you I love the book of Mark because Mark just kind of cuts to the chase. He just kind of quickly gets to just the main points, and he does it really fast. And the other gospels are great because they add in a lot of the imagery and I'd say the color to it, but Mark just kind of gets us right where we need to go. And so we're going to be going out of Mark chapter 5, but that requires us to jump back into Mark chapter 4 to be able to get a little bit of context. So if you've got your Bibles, open them up to Mark chapter 4, and we're going to kind of lay the context for where we're going to be teaching today. It says here in the beginning of Mark chapter 4, it says, Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake, and the crowd that gathered around him was so large, they got into a boat and sat in the lake while the people were along the shore, and he began to teach. And so uh, just a, a, a photo for you to see, we've got a, a picture here of just Galilee, because that's, that's where this is occurring again, is in the Galilee region. It's right just, you know, in northern kind of part of Israel. It's a beautiful lake. It's the only big freshwater uh, lake in the entire region. And this is where Jesus spends a majority of his time, we talked about this last week, 90% of his teaching, miracles, and all of that happen around the Galilee region. And so this is where our story in chapter 4 happens. It's right in this region around the Capernaum area near the shores. Jesus is teaching and people are coming to listen to him. And while they're listening to him, he has a couple of different things he says. And I wish we had time to get into these, but he gives some parables. And these parables themselves could be an entire talk that we could do together. But he talks about a lamp under a stand. He talks about the parable of growing seed. He talks about the parable of a mustard seed. And, and again, an, an understanding of why he does this is because this entire region around Galilee, not only do you have fishermen, but it's all agricultural. So these are all farmers. These are people who would understand exactly. Jesus is using language of their time, and he's putting the teachings into these parables. And then it gets to chapter, or verse 35 in chapter 4, and it says this. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, um, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. And so what we get right now is that Jesus is teaching. It says that he was uh, along the shore. He's sitting in a boat. There's all these people there listening to him. Finally, after a long day of teaching, Jesus says, hey, let's get in a boat that we're already in. Let's take these boats and let's go to the other side of the lake. Now, to you and me, that might not mean much. But to somebody in the first century, they'd understand immediately what is going on here. And this is a crazy statement to make. Now, first off, you'll notice it says they took multiple boats. And the reason for that is because boats are very small. If you get up into the Galilee region or Israel in general, almost everything's made out of stone because there's not a lot of, not a lot of trees, not a lot of wood. So it's very difficult to, to make things out of wood because it's, there's a lack of it. And so when you see these boats, they're tiny. So we've got a sketch here that we're going to put up a picture, actually, of a boat that was found. This boat was found in 1986 when the lake was low, and it's 27 feet long by about seven and a half feet wide. It's tiny. Whenever I take people to Israel and we go look at this boat, it's called the Jesus boat because it's from the first century, so they just gave it this name so people would come check it out. And you go look at this thing, and you're just going, this thing was on the Sea of Galilee? It's tiny. You could maybe fit six people in it. And even at that, I would wonder about how well it would float. Small, small boat. But these are the boats. Because in Jesus' time of the first century, people, when they would go fishing, would typically stay about 100 yards off the shore at the furthest. They didn't venture very far out. And so the fishermen would fish out that direction, and they wouldn't be too far off of shore. And they'd be in these little, little boats. Now, the next part of it says, Jesus says, hey, let's go to the other side. So I've got a slide for you, too, that I want you to see really quick, just to understand. It's a picture of the Galilee. And you'll notice that there are two red dots. 
The red dot on the northern part, this is the Capernaum area where they are at, where Jesus is teaching. And then the part that you see down below, this is called Hippos or Susita. And this is where Jesus is going to take them when he says, let's go to the other side. Now, we're going to get into a little bit more of a discussion about what that means in a second. But just to put it this way, Jewish people don't go to the other side. The other side is where pagans live. The northern part of the Galilee up on the top, this is where the Jewish remnant, the Jewish people are. Jewish town was where we're at. Good Jews live up here. Crossed on the other side, Romans, pagans, people who are not Jewish. You wouldn't go over there. So just to give you a setting piece, when the prodigal son story happens, it's taking place in a scenario just like this, where Jesus is giving giving the prodigal son story. He says that the boy goes off to a far-off land. That would be considered the far-off land. Not very far away, the other side of the lake, but that's a whole other world over there, a whole other world of beliefs and people. And this is where our story takes place. Jesus says, hey, I've just got done teaching, a long time of teaching, Hey, let's just go to the other side. You know, it's going to be great. We're going to go on over there. And for these Jewish boys who are in this boat, they've probably never been there before. You don't go there. This isn't a place that you would make a way over to. Your mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, everyone in your life has told you, don't go to the other side. Don't go over to this pagan land. Yet Jesus just kind of, I love how he does it. It's just like an afterthought of like, hey, we got done teaching. Let's go get a burrito somewhere. Like, let's just go to the other side. And so here they go. So here's what it says. It says, it says that um, there they were. Let us go to the other side, leaving the crowd behind. He took him, they took him along just as he was in the boat. And there was also other boats with him. A furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. All right, Jesus, you want to go to the other side? We don't think it's a good idea, but let's do this. And so they take their boats. Remember, these are fishermen. They start making their way to the other side. And as they're going across, all of a sudden, this squall comes up. Now, if you ever get a chance to go to Israel, the Sea of Galilee, it looks beautiful, but it can become one of the most fearsome little storms you've ever seen because the sea is below sea level, the um, lake is below sea level. And so you get the wind coming off the Mediterranean, and it comes down into this valley, and then it just bounces back and forth off of these mountains that are there. And all of a sudden, the wind can come up. And I've been on it many a times where you get these waves, and, and it's just crazy. And so the waves come up, and Jesus is in this boat. And all of a sudden, these guys are sitting there going, we told you, Jesus, this is a bad idea. We should not go to the other side. Now, also in Jewish thought, and this is just interesting to know for the first century is time that we're talking about, is that people believed that the water, the underworld, the underneath part of the lake, the abyss, this is kind of the gates into hell. They would say that the Leviathan lives in there. They'd say that this is, this is, it's just, it's the unknown. And so because of it being the unknown, they, they would have these just thoughts that it was, it was something evil. And so they wouldn't venture out. They wouldn't, they wouldn't mess with it. But here's Jesus saying, let's go to the other side. And a furious squall comes up. And I love what happens here. It broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. I mean, you saw the picture of the boat. Crazy little boat. It's about, these boats are about to sink. But listen to this part. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. Now you've seen the size of the boat. Like when I grew up and I heard this story, I used to think Jesus was at some other part of the boat. He has no clue what's going on. But Jesus is kind of like right in the middle of all of this. If this boat is full of people and the water's coming in and you're trying to bail the water out, And Jesus is now in the way. Not only is he in the way, he's asleep and he's not helping. This is not a helpful situation. But Jesus is there. And so they they go to Jesus who's in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care if we drown? They're in the midst of chaos. They're unsure what to do. These are fishermen. They They should be used to kind of some of these situations. But they're sitting in a place where they're concerned for their lives. And Jesus is asleep. Now, when I get to heaven, one of the questions that I think I'm going to ask Jesus when I get there, I mean, maybe my whole thought process will change when I see him, but is going to be, hey, were you fully asleep or were you pulling the dad move like I do all the time with my kids? One eye open, one eye closed, waiting to see what they do. You've always, you're always looking out for them. But what are they going to do in this situation? 
I kind of believe that's probably might be what's happening here. But Jesus gets up after they wake him up, after they're pleading with him that they're going to die. And I love how he does this. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. And then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. Jesus takes care of the chaos like that, with a word. Done. And listen to what the disciples do right here. Because he says to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. I think something that's really good for us to know right now is that God is in control of it all. Even in the midst of the chaos, he can stop the chaos if he needs to. And he does so right here. He stops it. And so here's a situation where we can sit there and go, so great that in the midst of the chaos, Jesus steps in and boom, it's over. He takes care of it. But look at what Mark chooses to tell us next. The story is not over. That's just the beginning of it. They get in a boat. The chaos comes up. They know they shouldn't probably go to the other side. They're going to the other side. They almost die because their boat almost goes under. And then they wake Jesus up and he stops the chaos, right? Remember, they're going to the other side. Very next thing, it says, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. So let's pull up a couple more pictures. I've got one of the Decapolis cities. I want to explain that to you really quick. Um, There's a map, I think, if we still have got it, to be able to put it up there. It says Decapolis on it, and it's got a bunch of cities. And if we don't have it, that's okay. But what the Decapolis cities were is, there we go, the Decapolis cities, Deca means 10 and Polis means city. So 10 cities. So what happened was after the first century, um, when Herod the Great dies, he's kind of controlling the region. He dies and his land gets split between his three sons. But Rome also comes into the scene because they've been there the whole time. They go, well, we've got all of these really great cities that are Roman cities that have a lot of influence. We're not giving those up. And so they left these 10 cities of the Decapolis in control of Rome. Now, many of these are on the Jordanian side. So if you were to go to Jordan, there are a lot of them over there. And then there are a couple that are right on the Sea of Galilee region. And one of those happens to be a place in Greek called Hippos. Hippos or Hippo in Greek means horse. And so it was Horseville. This was a city that was right on the Sea of Galilee that had a whole bunch of of military officers there with horses. So it became known as Horseville. In Hebrew, the word for horse is Sus. And so it became also known as Susita. So the, that town or the, the uh, city of the horses is what this place is. It's a very, very powerful place. And so as you can see in this picture here, it's this mountain that's kind of its own little mountain. And up on top of it was the city. And they brought water in from like 15 miles away on an aqueduct. And it was amazing. So if you've ever been to Rome before, colonnades, flowing water, bathhouses, it looked impressive. And so if you get to go to Israel, I always tell people this is a really cool place to go. One, it has the most beautiful sunsets when you're sitting on top of it. But two, it shows you just how defendable and how amazing this place was. And this is where we get the storyline of going. So that Jesus is going. Sorry, I don't know why this is making, making noise. But, ooh. Try to leave it alone a little bit. So Jesus is going to the other side. So he makes his way over there, and he's coming to a place called Hippos, most likely. And it says that as soon as he gets there, as soon as they get to the other side, it says that when Jesus got there out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit from the tombs came to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot and broke the chains and irons of his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day amongst the tombs and in the hills, he would cry and cut himself with stones. This guy's nuts. And the moment they get off the boat, if you remember seeing that it's a hillside, cities on the top, tombs are down outside of the city, and they get right off the boat. And right when they get out of the boat, the first person to come meet them on the pagan side, the other side, is this crazy guy. And he shows right up. And if, you know, if I'm thinking about the disciples if they haven't already kind of wet themselves already with the storm, they're now doing that right now. They're freaked out. Jesus, we told you, we shouldn't have come over here. We come this direction, 
a storm comes up. We get over here, this crazy guy shows up who's got demons. He's here to get us. So what is Jesus going to do? He's going to interact with this guy. And the disciples are there watching. So Jesus gets there. He gets to the other side. And all of a sudden, this man is waiting for them. And we get this interaction that he comes running up to Jesus. And he says this to him. It says, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell at his, at his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God that you will not torture me. Remember before when Jesus calms the storm, the disciples are like, who is this guy? And all of a sudden they show up here on the other side and this man comes right up and calls him exactly who he is. Son of the most high God. He is God. He says, don't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. Again, interesting, we could get into a whole conversation on this, but Mark is making sure we understand this. Why is the guy's name Legion? Because he's in a Roman area. Who has legions? The Romans do. Who has control over the Jewish people at this time? The Romans do. And in this moment, it's Jesus versus, if you want to call it that, Rome. And what does Jesus do with this man? He casts the demons out, for there are many of them. Legion is going to be healed. A large herd of pigs were feeding on the nearby hillside, and the demons begged Jesus, send us amongst the pigs. Allow us to go into them. And he gave them permission, and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and were drowned. Again, crazy picture here. If you're on the Jewish side, would you find pigs? You wouldn't. They're unclean. You come over to the pagan side, you're going to find pigs everywhere. And 2,000 pigs... No matter what the pigs are used for, this is a lot of them, and this is a lot of money, an investment of having these pigs. On this side of the Decapolis, up on Susita, they have found the remnants of a couple of temples, and one of them is to Dionysus. And the way that they would worship and that they would give sacrifice is they would give sacrifices of pigs. Just like over in the Jewish side, if you were to go to the temple, they would give a lamb. Over here, they would give a pig. So we've got a lot going on, and you're going to see here that it's possible, one, that Jesus in one fell swoop gets rid of all the religious pigs, maybe, from the area, from their worship. But to say the least, he gets rid of a lot of money that makes people frustrated. So Jesus is there. The demoniac's there. Jesus casts the demons out. They go into the pigs, and where do they run? They run directly down into the lake. Remember the Jewish thought of that time is that that was the underworld. That was the place down into hell. And so where do they go? They go put themselves back to where they came from. That's the thought of the Jewish mindset. And Jesus in this moment is doing these crazy things in the midst of chaos. Now you would think that because of he's taking care of this demoniac that all of a sudden people would be really happy. This guy's been a problem for them for years. He's been creating issues all around their city. And now he's been healed. But what do they do? Those tending the pigs ran off and reported it into the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Okay, side note. The guy was naked before. So you've got the crazy guy. He's now healed. And I can see it now. They walk up, and he's sitting next to Jesus. He's got clothes on. His hair's combed over nice. And he's sitting there talking, I don't know, maybe politics, maybe religion. I don't know what he's talking about, but he's in his right mind with Jesus. But as always with the world, the world that doesn't always make sense. And those who had seen it told the people what had happened, and the demon-possessed man, and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus, leave their region. We don't care that you, you healed this guy. We don't care that you brought the chaos away from him. Just leave. Get out of here. On a boat, comes across, runs into this crazy guy, heals the crazy guy, 
pigs running into the ocean, into the lake, and now everyone wants him to leave. So what does he do? He gets back in the boat and heads back to the other side. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon possessed begged him to go. Jesus do not, uh, did not let him go, but said, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell everyone in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Two stories, right? Story one, disciples, let's go to the other side. Wind and waves, Jesus stops it in a second. The chaos is put to rest. Story two, they get to the Decapolis side. There's the demoniac. Jesus heals him. They get back in the boat and go back. Think about this poor guy. He's got no training. He's got nothing. He wants to go back with Jesus, and Jesus says, no, stay here. And they leave. If you're one of the disciples, you're sitting there going, what is going on? What a waste. We almost died coming across the lake, and now we're heading back all for that? We know in chaos, things don't always make sense, but I want you to know this. God is in control whether he stops something or doesn't. And there's always a plan because he's doing something bigger. If you look here, too, let's just kind of see what happens. They go back. They get back onto the Capernaum side. Jesus is going to go over. It says, when, they, when Jesus again had crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him. And he basically was rushed off to go help some people um, whose daughter had died. He's going to do miracles. We look at Mark chapter 6. He's going to send out the 12. He's going to feed the 5,000. We've all heard that story. He's going to walk on water. Chapter 7 kind of goes on. It says here in verse 24 of chapter 7, Jesus left the place of Capernaum and went to the vicinity of Tyre. So he's going to go up into modern-day Lebanon. He's going to teach and do some things up there. And then in verse 31, it says this. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went to Sidon, down to the Sea of Galilee, and then into the region of the Decapolis. So our next storyline that I want to finish with for you is that Jesus goes back to the Decapolis. Only the second time that we know he goes back over there. And it says this in verse 1 of chapter 8. During those days, another large crowd gathered. We're about to tell the story of the feeding of the 4,000. Friends, the feeding of the 4,000 didn't happen in a Jewish area. It happened in the Decapolis. First time Jesus came to the Decapolis, no one wanted him there. They ran into one man. Everyone else told him to leave. Second time he comes a couple chapters later, he's feeding 4,000 people. 4,000 people from a pagan area are wanting to hear what a Jewish teacher has to say. Now, I don't know this to be true, and we'll find this out completely when we get to heaven, but I can imagine this. Jesus is scanning this crowd of 4,000 people, and he's teaching, and all of a sudden he looks over and he makes eye contact with one guy sitting in the back, and that guy just looks up and says, it's the crazy guy, he says, Jesus, I brought some friends. You see, the story is that he went out and told everyone in the Decapolis, and all of a sudden everyone is showing up. Was it because of him? I got to believe that that's a part of it. Mark leaves it to our imagination a little bit about why everyone's coming out. But my point to you is this, is even in the midst of the chaos, when things don't make sense, God has a plan, and your story matters. So friends, if God chooses not to stop the waves like he did in the story in chapter 5, but he chooses to kind of leave the chaos going a little bit, how are you going to live your life? Are you going to live your life in a way that reflects him? Are you going to live your story out in the midst of chaos so that people will know him? Because last week we talked about bringing people to the feet of Jesus and living out of our story is part of how we do that. God's always at work, my friends. This is what I'm taking into my soul these days when things just don't make sense is how do we as the church live out our story in such a way that people see it and want to know more about who Christ is? Let me pray for us. Lord, thanks for today. Thanks for a chance just to open your word, to dig into the text, to know you in a deeper way. And God, I'm grateful that you have the power to stop the chaos. 
as shown when you calm the oceans, when you calm the waves of the Sea of Galilee. But Lord, also knowing that you've got a bigger plan, and that plan is to draw people to you. So Lord, may we in these moments that feel out of control understand that you are in control and that we've got to live our story out reflecting you so that people will know who you are. We give you today, Lord. Amen.